Uh, right then. So, yeah, my uh, my talk this afternoon is what do you know about God? And and probably if I'd thought about it more before I'd invented the title, I'd probably gone, what do you already know about God? Because the, the idea behind this was I wanted to take something that people are sort of aware of uh, and just say, OK, so so this is something which you which you know already. Well, well, what does that tell you about God? And, and really, it was the, the Lord's Prayer. So we've, we've just read it. And that was what I wanted to, to base the talk on this afternoon. And because I think the Lord's Prayer is probably quite familiar to most of us. Um, I certainly remember when I was back at school that, that we used to sit in an assembly each morning and, and we used to, to um, I'm going to use the word murmur, um, because it was as a, a group of 300 teenagers together, it was more, more of a murmur or a mumble, that the, the Lord's Prayer together, it, it was what we did in our school. And probably my, my feeling is at the time we did it we were probably uh, in a, a minority of schools that used to say the lord's prayer together like that um i suspect if you're older than me so i'm 44 i suspect if you're older than me you may well have said the lord's prayer together each morning um if you're younger than me then you probably haven't um but equally it's a it's a bit of the bible that, that quite a lot of people will have heard from time to time it, the words will be at the very least familiar to you and, and what I was thinking was, if we, we take this, this, these words from the Lord's Prayer, well, well, what does this actually tell us about God? Because it does tell us quite a lot. There's quite a lot packed into this little prayer. Um, and, and so we'll, that, that, that's my plan for this afternoon. So, so if you do know what the Lord's Prayer looks like, you'll, you'll know how far down we're getting. So you can, you can sort of see how quickly we're moving through it. Um, and and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go through that. Interestingly, I'm not the first person to to think that the Lord's Prayer has got quite a lot of information in it. So, so Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, it, he said. So, uh, there's a quote from him: "If if somebody said, give me a summary of Christian faith on the back of an envelope, the best thing to do would be to write our Lord's Prayer." Uh, and as I said, I, I I think for for a good number of people, you wouldn't even have to write it down. Although probably it's becoming more of a, a, a more of a requirement these days, I guess. And and so let's have a look at, at what the Lord's Prayer it says and and what we can learn from it. And and if you've got your Bibles in front of you, you'll you'll have Matthew chapter six there, and, and it's it's uh, it's recorded from verse nine um, down to verse uh, down to verse thirteen, uh, and 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 we 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 hopefully find those words fairly familiar. But, but it starts with the words, our father. Um, and, and so, so yeah, what, what specifically does, does this tell you? How, how can this help us? Well, well, the first thing is, and, and what I'm going to do this afternoon is we, we'll have the little section we're looking at and we'll have a, a couple of, of quotes from the rest of the Bible there next to it. Uh, if you want to turn to these, you can, but equally the, the important bits of each quote will be on the screen behind me. And, and, and so, yeah, we, we've just got these two words, our father. And, and if we look at the rest of the Bible, well, there's the, these verses in, in the first letter of John uh, and chapter three. And it says there, behold, what manner of love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Uh, and there's a, another section that I'll just point us to in Psalm 103. So this is verses 13 to 14. Uh, As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And so these verses, these, these two words, I think, point us to the, the idea that God wants to be have, have a relationship with us where, where he, is the, he is our father uh, and, and we are his children. That's, that's the aim of God and, and the things that he's done on the earth. And, and, and John says, look, this is a, a great act of love, isn't it? Because he's willing to, in effect, adopt us as children and, and look after us as children. Uh, and, and we will be known as children of God, is, is what John says to us. And, and, and the Psalms takes that a bit further. He says, do you know what? He treats us like children. So he, he loves us uh, as children. He, he knows us as well as we know our own children. Uh, I, I know I listened to somebody who said that, uh, and, 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 and it's equally true with my own children, but I, I remember one, one person who was speaking of, of his children. He said, do you know what? I, if I kicked a football into the road, my, my two sons would behave differently. And, and I know which one would, would say, oh, no, I, I need, to, need to check for traffic. And I know which one would run straight into the road. And to be fair, I can think the same with my two children. But, but that's the kind of knowledge that, that you have of your children. 
Uh, and that's the kind of knowledge that, that God has of us, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Uh, and so just those first two words of this prayer tell us a lot about who God is and, and, and the sort of relationship he wants to have with, with people who live on the earth. Uh, and I say on the earth because the, the next two words are in heaven. And, and, and what is the heaven? Well, well, this isn't on the slide, but it, the very first verses of the Bible say, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Uh, and so we're, we're introduced right from the very beginning of the Bible to, to a concept of that, you know, where there's this split. There's where God lives and then there's the earth where, where man lives. And, and, and that carries on through the, the rest of the Bible. So, so Psalm 115 verse 16 says, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's but the earth he has given to the children of men. And so, so that split between heaven and earth is, is a split about where, where people live. And, and we acknowledge that, that God lives somewhere different to us. And Timothy, 1 Timothy 6 verse 16 says of God, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see. And, and so we, we, we take this idea that God is living in heaven and, and is separate to people somehow. So, so he wants to have a relationship with us, but, but he lives somewhere different to us. Right, if, you, if you're going through it in your mind, so our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name is the, is the next bit, isn't it? Uh, and, and what does that mean? It's a, it's a tricky word, isn't it, hallowed? So, so what does that mean? Well, we can we can identify it from from places in the Bible and we can we can maybe understand it a little bit better anyway. But but the idea of hallowed is worshipped. So I'm going to turn back to Exodus 33 because uh, it's it's useful to have a little bit of context around this one. So Exodus 33 uh, verse 17 So, so Moses is talking to God and, and Moses says in, in Exodus 33, verse 17, so or God says to Moses, so the Lord said to Moses, I have, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight and I know you by name. So, so firstly, God is saying, look, I'm, I'm, I'm in this sort of relationship, this, this relationship that we've already talked about between father and son. I, I know you, I know you by name, God says. And then verse 18, he, and then he, that's Moses said, Please show me your glory. So, so show me how great you are, Moses says. Verse 19, then God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So, so Moses says, please show me your glory. And God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. So so that's the sort of the, the start of this. And then if we go into chapter 34 uh, and we'll I'll have a look at verse eight, uh, verse five. Sorry. Now, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And, and so we, we have this, this idea that, that what God tells Moses is his name and and really it's a set of titles isn't it uh, we, we have King Charles who's who's the, the the king of 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 um of the UK isn't he but but he also has a, a series of other titles of which I tend to forget which sort of describe that he's the he's the king of of England Scotland and Wales and and Northern Ireland isn't he and he's the the head of the Commonwealth and and he has a series of titles that describes what it is that he does uh, and a bit like that, God has a, a, a name which, which describes what he does. Uh, and so it says he's, he's merciful and gracious. He's long-suffering. He's abounding in goodness and truth. He, he, he gives mercy to thousands of people um, and he forgives iniquity and transgression. So he forgives people who do wrong. But, but equally, people who, who don't ask for forgiveness, well, well they are punished. And, and God's name describes all these things which God does. And you can see what Moses' reaction was. He made haste and bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. 
And, and that's what the word hallowed means. It means worshipped. And, and so what, what these words are saying is that, that, that when we understand who God is and what he does, then we will want to worship him. We will want to hallow him and, and we will understand how great he is. So our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come is the, the next little bit of it, isn't it? And what does this tell us? Well, it, it tells us two things, does it? So it says that, that God has a kingdom. And if it says your kingdom come, it, it means that it's it's not here now. I think are the, the, the two bits that go into this. And so we have descriptions of a, of a kingdom. <clears throat> and it says that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. Uh, and so that's this that, that's the, the promise that goes throughout the whole of the Bible that, that's encapsulated in these three words. Uh, and it's a promise which which is is not yet happened. So it, it's a promise that will happen in the future. So it will it will happen in, uh, in, at some point in the future. Uh, and the, the, the prayer goes on to tell us a little bit about this kingdom. So your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, and so it, it tells us that, that things are going to change a little bit. We started off with this introduction of, of our father in heaven. So so what, what happens in heaven is, is different to what happens on earth. And, and this says, well, well, what happens in heaven is going to be done on earth, is what this bit of the prayer says. And, and there's uh, back in Genesis, there's a, a little bit of an idea about what it is that the, the difference between heaven and earth and so it says a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So you've got this, the, 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 the division between heaven and earth and you've got the angels who are moving between the two. And, and, and what does that tell us? Well, it tells us what written about a little bit about the angels. Uh, and I'll turn to Hebrews chapter one. Uh, so Hebrews 1 uh, verse 13 but to which of the angels has he ever said sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation and, and so we have a, a little bit of a, an introduction there to the the angels and and what they can do and, and the angels uh, don't have a, a, the ability to make their own decision they don't have free will uh, and so they do what God says. And, and so God and the angels are in heaven. And so therefore, everything that God wants to be done is done in heaven. But whereas on the earth, God has put people who, who can decide whether they want to do that which is right or that which is wrong. Uh, and so that's the difference between heaven and the earth at the moment, that, that everything God wants to be done is done in heaven. Uh, and on the earth, things that God doesn't want to happen are, are done. Uh, and what the uh, what the that the prayer is saying is that that in the future things will be different that, that things will be done on earth uh, exactly as god wants them to be uh, rather than as people decide to do it so our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven but what comes next it's it's give us this day our daily bread isn't it and, and i think this is uh, talking about an acknowledgement that, that god looks after us God is in control of the world and, and God provides things for us. Uh, and there's some great verses in Psalm 104, for example, which says that, that God causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man that he may bring food forth, may bring forth food from the earth. Uh, and so God, it says, is in charge of the world and, and the way in which plants grow and and animals eat plants and and all these things can be used to provide food for for man but but also that that god god created the world uh, and so it, it sort of says in terms of creation you you take away in fact i'm going to turn to this one because the, the 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 wider the wider quote is helpful for this one uh, so psalm 104 verse 27 says these all wait for you that you may give them their food in due season what you give them they gather in you open your hand they are filled with good you hide your face and they are troubled you take away their breath they die and return to the dust you send forth your spirits they are created and you renew the face of the earth 
Uh, and so God is in charge of creation uh, and he he sustains life and keeps it going. And, and God, if he removes his breath from, from living creatures, then they die. So, so, so God is in control of the world in which he created. There's a, a verse in Acts chapter 17 where it says, for in him we live and move and have our being. And, and so God is in complete control of, of, of our lives and, and, and ha how long those are. And, and so, yes, give us this day our daily bread is remembrance of, of, of that and, and uh, an acknowledgement of that. Uh, so give us this day our daily bread and, and forgive us our debts or and, as, forgive us our trespasses, depending on, on which translation you, you, you like to use. Uh, and this is to do with, with, um, with, with forgiveness, isn't it? And so, so we turn to we turn to one Timothy two verse four, and that tells us a little bit more about this. It says, "Who God desires all men to be saved, and to come to a knowledge of the truth." So, so that's God's wants that He wants that all these people who are deciding what to do, that actually what they decide to do is learn a little bit more about Him. If you you already know that the Lord's prayer, it's it's to do something like this and think, okay, so so what do these words mean? Or, or if you know a bit more, it's to turn to your Bible and think, OK, what does the Bible tell us about God? And, and this says that that is actually what God wants for everybody to to have this opportunity to come to a knowledge of him and his word, the Bible. Uh, and then in, in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, it says he's long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, and again, that's this idea of, of being forgiven. So, so knowing about God and realizing that maybe you're not doing things that are quite what God wants to do. So, so asking for forgiveness and, and God will forgive us those things. So, so forgive us our debts uh, as we forgive our debtors is the next part of the, 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 the prayer. And, and I'm going to turn back to, to Matthew chapter five. Say back, turn forward to Matthew chapter five. Uh, so Matthew chapter 5, verse 39, it says, But I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. And and so you have this, this, this teaching of Jesus, which says, do you know what, in God, God is willing to forgive you for for doing things that are wrong. But 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 in in order to sort of show that you understand that, what you need to do is put that into practice in your own lives. So so when people do things to you that are wrong, then then you need to go and uh, and forgive them in the same way. And so Jesus says, look, if you get get hit by someone, well well let them hit you again, and and if they take you to court and try and take you take something away from you, well give you give them that and much more. Because we need to forgive in the same way that God has forgiven. And Matthew chapter 7, so, so on a page or two, says, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And so Jesus is saying, look, this is the, this is the yardstick by which God will measure you. If, if you go and forgive others, then he will forgive you because he will see that you understand what it is that he's willing to do for you. And, and that is in, encapsulated in this line. So, so we, God will forgive us as we forgive others, is, is those two lines put together. The, the next line then. So, so, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, is, is the way it's translated in the, the New King James. And the idea is, is really do not let us be led into temptation. Try and try and help us to, to be steered away from it. And, and it is an important distinction to make this one, because the, the Bible is very clear, uh, and, and it's recorded especially in, in James chapter 1. So, so James chapter 1 verse 13 says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. 
Then when desire has deceived, has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And so the Bible is quite clear that, that temptations are a human issue, a human problem, that, that wanting to do what is wrong it is something that, that, that people are, are, are feel and, and not something that God feels at all. And, and so, so God does not tempt us. We are tempted ourselves. But the prayer is that God will help us through these temptations when, when we are, are feeling that we might not want to do the things that God has, has asked us to do. We, we are asking for help to do that which God has asked us to do. And that's what, uh, what this line of the prayer is saying. And then we come towards the end of the prayer. For yours is the kingdom uh, and the power and the glory. Uh, and I'm going to turn to, to 1 Chronicles 29. Uh, so 1 Chronicles 29, and this is King David, who, who was king over the, the nation of Israel, talking towards the end of his life. Uh, and he, he talks about the things that God has done for him. Uh, and in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 10, it says, Therefore David blessed the, the Lord before all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in, in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honour come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and we praise your glorious name. And so David comes to the end of his life where he's led the nation of Israel. And, and David has managed to do some fantastic things uh, uh, within that nation. But, but David says, do you know what? Everything belongs to God. Everything that I've managed to do that we've managed to do as a people is, is because you've allowed us to God. And, and, and everything is in your control. And so this line, like what David says, is, is an acknowledgement that, that God is in control of the world that God is all-powerful and, and the world should worship him. And, and then there is one final word uh, in the prayer, and, and that is the word forever. And, and that's the interesting one, really, because we know that, that we have a finite life. We know that we, we live and we die, and, and that's the end of our lives, don't we? But, but we know that, that God is described as living forever. God doesn't have a start and he doesn't have an end. And, and that is in itself a, a, an interesting thing, because actually, when you start to look through the Bible, you find that, that, that God promises the same things to, to us. So, so those who try to follow him, uh, God has this offer of a kingdom, uh, and, and this offer of a kingdom is a kingdom that will last forever, It is what you, you learn as you, you start to look at it. <laughs> uh, and so, so that is probably the, the most exciting word in the whole prayer. And so, yeah, my, my question that I started with was, what do you already know about God? And I think if, if the words of this prayer are familiar to you, you know quite a lot about God already. So, so we know that, the, that God looks upon us as his children. Um, we know that, that we should worship him because of how great he is. Uh, we know that he's waiting to set up a kingdom on the earth where everything will be done on the earth that, that he wants to be done. We know that God provides for us uh, and, and is responsible for, for keeping us alive. But we know that we do wrong and that God provides us a way to be forgiven when we do wrong. Uh, and we also know how we can show that, that we understand that that is what God wants. We know that he will help us to do what is right when we ask him to, uh, when we, we, we have this, this understanding of him. Uh, and we know that that he has he is going to set up a kingdom uh, that will last forever, uh, that will have a, a place for those who try to follow him. Uh, and so I think that we know quite a lot about God already. 
Um, but there is is one last verse that I'm going to turn to, which is 2 Peter 3, verse 9, uh, which we, we have already looked at, but it's worth bringing our minds back to. Uh, so Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And, and that verse says that, that God would like us all to have the opportunity to learn a little bit more about him. But it says that there, there is an opportunity, but that opportunity will come to an end. So, so God is not slack, he's not lazy he's he's not forgotten about this promise that he's made is what the verse says but but he's long suffering he's patient uh, and he's giving us the chance to learn a little bit more about him uh, so that all might ask for forgiveness and and have a chance to be in his kingdom but but the message that that, that we're given here in peter is that this is a a a, a an opportunity that will have an end uh, at which point god will set up his kingdom and and the opportunity to join that is too late so, so God would like you to learn a little bit more about him, more than you already know, and and try to follow him. But the only question that remains really is, is are you willing to do that? Thank you.